Good morning, everybody. I hope you're well on this Friday. One of these days it's going to be spring. I'm not sure it's going to be today though. Um, just working on this little tiny piece again. hand spun. Can you even see that? I don't know. Then my hands in the way most of the time. Well, some of you, it looks like, have moved right into summer. Which is good, right? We can sit outside. Except for those of you down in Australia, most of whom are not watching live because it's about 2.30 in the morning there. I suspect Australia is looking forward to some winter. We did some spinning yesterday. Plying. I'm trying to empty off some bobbins, those of you who are spinners. Bobbins for spinning wheels are not, they are pricey. Therefore, I only own a handful of them, and when they're all full of spinning, it makes it hard to do a new project. I want to do Jillian Moreno's sample along, and so I've been emptying bobbins. So today I can start. So let me just flip through your comments really quickly and um, say hello to everybody from all over the world. Um, <laughs> I like that. Plano, Texas, although in my mind I'm somewhere in the Bavarian Alps. That does sound nice. Although I think that uh, 
There's a lot of coronavirus in the Alps, so maybe I'd choose a different set of mountains. Good morning, Vancouver and UK and Alabama and Kansas. <laughs> and Shari, unweaving is part of the learning process, right? She said she's unweaving a second time from that same warp. Um, yeah, I don't know how it's Friday already, but. Um, Canada and Utah and Nebraska. And more from Texas and Bainbridge. Kathleen, thank you for the reminder. Uh, hold on, let me grab my notes. Um, yes, Kathleen, I will remember because I wrote it down. Well, that doesn't guarantee I'll remember, but I'll try. Uh, yes. Um, all right, Janet's in Beulah, which is in Colorado. Welcome, Colorado. It's a beautiful place. Um, Marlena did a four salvage on the saffron. So those of you in the Facebook group, check that out. She's going to put it up there soon. I'll be curious to see how she did that. Um, Vermont. Oh, Angie, so I had seen your question go by and I was trying to get back to it. Angie's asking about this as I'm doing this. She's saying, am I trying to match the colors side to side? And sadly, I am too lazy to do that. Um, there should be, there must be a way to make them match on either side of the window. Um, it would take a little bit of fussing with um, where the repeats were in the hand spun yarn and I was too lazy to do that. So I'm just going to say that this side is in a little more shadow than this side and that's why this is a little darker. Um, in another world or on another piece, Angie, I would have worked harder at that, but um, I did not try to match them on this piece. Jeanette, um, yes, I do um, wish we were in Abusan right now. Is that where we were a year ago? Not quite, but um, yeah, that would be fun. Jenny was on the trip that I took to France, and um, we were in France in, gosh, maybe it was, it was May last year. I think it was a little, a few weeks later, but yeah. Um, Debra is asking about the warp. That's a good question. She says, I usually use 12-9 cotton seine twine and I wanted to buy another size. Which size would be the most useful? So this is the 22, um, 26, sorry, um, 20 slash 6. And when I double this, it might be about the same size as the 12.9. It's a good thought. Um, if you're going to do things at small sets, this is at 12 ends per inch. If you're going to do things at 12 inch ends per inch or more warps per inch, then the 26 is great. Um, otherwise, it won't be useful. Um, unless you're doing like fringeless tapestries where the warp is doubled, I like to use the 26 a lot for that. So it is a good size, Deborah, but it depends on what you're using it for. Um, Laura, this bobbin is um, the smallest one that Melissa Ellison Dewey makes. It is called the, she has some bobbin that's called like the skinniest mini. I think that's what it is. Th that's what this is. She has similar sized ones that are a little bit fatter. Here's one. Nope, that's also skinny. This one is a little bit fatter, maybe? I don't know. She has ones that are slightly thicker. Um, 
Karen, that's a good question. So let me show you this weaving. So here, Karen's asking if there's a slit right here, and I'm sorry this is actually fairly difficult for you to see, I'm sure. Let's see if I can get the camera to zoom in here. Um, maybe you can see it there. There is actually, um, I'm doing a, it's not a dovetail because I'm alternating, but this warp here and this warp here, I'm alternating Come on camera. I'm alternating um, which color wraps around it. So in one sequence, this hand spun is wrapping around it and in the other sequence, the brown is. It's like a dovetail, except I'm not, a dovetail would wrap each color on every sequence, which with this thin yarn would probably also work, but I am alternating and making a little thing. So there is not a slit there. And I showed you this yesterday that I took out the silk that was in here and I put double half hitches along the bottom. And I'm going to leave these warps open just for fun. Um, oh, that's cool, Carol. Um, so I actually, Carol's talking about sketchbook school. So those of you in my design class who actually would like to learn to draw um, or go back to drawing, which is my case, I haven't really done much drawing in about 15 years. So I um, jumped onto a class at sketchbook school actually about using the iPad, but I've been eyeing their um, boot camp class, which is drawing every day. And Carol says that Sketchbook School has a free class to the people on the front lines. So she signed up for the six week boot camp. That's the one I'm looking at, Carol. So if you are, um, I don't know if they have restrictions on who can sign up, but um, if you're a nurse or you need some downtime or a doctor or you're working in um, grocery stores, whatever, I don't know what their criteria is, but check out Sketchbook School. Um, I'll put a link in the, on that page. Um, in my, uh, the page on my website. It's spelled funny. School is S-K-O-O-L. Thanks, Carol. Um, so Linda's another question about warp. Um, 12, six cotton seam twine, Linda, is the warp that I use have used for many years at, um, I'm gonna back that out a little cause I think the camera will focus better. 12, six cotton seam twine is the warp that I've used for years at eight ends per inch. It is quite thin and you'll see a lot of people like a bit thicker warp. 12, nine is slightly thicker. I now use both of those inter pretty much interchangeably at eight ends per inch, but oops. Wrong shed. They are um, they are fine at eight ends per inch. Anything between twelve six and twelve twelve at eight ends per inch works well. Twelve twelve is twice the size of twelve six, so um, that has other ramifications for your weft size and what the final piece you know what the ribs look like in the piece but any of those sizes will work. Okay. 98 degrees in LA, are you kidding me, Michelle? Gosh. Um, that's real hot, it never gets that hot, almost never gets that hot here. Occasionally it gets over 100, but... Um, Why did you tie knots with the, oh, Dorothy. So yesterday, um, and I was just talking about this, right here at the bottom, you cannot see them, but with this Weaver's Bazaar yarn, I tied double half hitch knots at the bottom. And that is because I'm going to leave these warps open and the knots will hold. If I didn't have knots in here, the weft is just free to roam about and cause havoc. So. I don't want the weft sliding around. I want those holes to stay open. 
And it is my opinion that if you're going to leave open warps, you should use knots to keep the weaving in place. Um, unless you're doing, I've seen lots of sort of freeform work where the weft is just loose. It's not really tapestry, but it's just loose in the warp. And it creates a beautiful lacy effect, but that weft is not going to stay there. It is going to move around. And the piece is not like a stable, long-term piece of fabric. So I'm looking for stability so the knots are so that it stays stable. Um. Cool. Yes, I put the links from the stuff we talked about yesterday, the Helena Herrnmark stuff, and I can't even remember now what we talked about, but I put some links on that page, which is right, see that green box right there? That's where it is. Oh, Kit, do you mean the spin along? I'm not doing a weave along. Um, I was just muttering about Jillian Moreno is a spinner and I'm doing, um, she's doing a, she calls it a sample along and her, um, website and blog is Jillian, J I L L I A N Moreno, just like it sounds, um, dot com. So if you're interested in doing some spinning, I'm hoping the weather will get warm and I can been on the deck. So far in Colorado, it's like 55-ish and raining last night. Not that we ever complain about rain. Um, hello from Athens, Greece. Welcome. It's fun to have people from all over the world. Oh, Jennifer, you were talking about spinning wheel bobbins. I thought you were talking about tapestry bobbins um and i was gonna say I, you could 3d print tapestry bobbins but it's much nicer to have um wooden ones i have seen the 3d print printed bobbins and um also people that are making them i think they're making and selling them i will try them at some point it's uh, a good idea mostly i'm just trying to get i'm trying to get projects finished instead of putting them on. I have lots of bobbins that I put spun yarn that isn't plied yet. Um, just uh, boat shuttle bobbins. And I use those a lot, but I'm trying to actually finish projects instead of just putting them in closets half finished. So, but thank you. I will look at um, that 3D printing reference. It's a great idea. Oh yeah, Marianne, I was wondering about that. She said leaving the warps open makes it feel a little bit like, you know, the sort of jail we're in at the moment. So yes, I did actually think of that when I was thinking about leaving these open. Thank you, Marlena. I'm sorry I didn't mean to offend you with the way that you spell school, S-K-O-L. I didn't realize that that is um, a way that it's spelled in Dutch and Afrikaans, but in English, school is spelled S-C-H-O-O-L. And I don't know if Danny Gregory is from South Africa or um, somewhere else, but the way that they spell it in there, they also spell a bunch of other words um, wrong, um, like course they spell with a K, which is just one of my pet peeves in life. like. KOA camping cabins with a K. Um, but thank you for correcting me. We'll have to. Danny Gregory is the one who wrote that monkey book. If you're in the design class, um, the book, of, uh, it's called Shut Your Monkey which my friend Victoria told me about. And um, turns out it's a great book, but he has also written, I think, three other books about drawing, which are really great. So check them out. If you don't want to take an online class about drawing, I think his drawing books are really fun. Um, hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. And then I said that and then Victoria posted. Um, yes. So Danny Gregory has some great books if you don't want to do the online thing. Um, Kit, yes. Um, doesn't matter what loom I'm using. 12-6 cotton seam twine I do use at 8 EPI. Um, I do use it on my big macomber. I have a baby Mac. I don't like it the most for um, tapestry. My baby Mac is really old. It doesn't hold great tension. It was my grandmother's very first loom, so it's probably 60 years old. Some of the newer baby Macs. So Macomber makes a small workshop loom. Um, some of those work okay. Yes, I will put half hitches at the top of the window too, Kathleen. Great question. Um, couple of you from Albuquerque, my home turf. <laughs> Hi, Patty. Glad you made it here. Um, yes, there are many ways, different ways of spelling words in different cultures, and I don't mean to offend anybody by any of my opinions about the best way to spell words. Um, I apologize for all of it, and um, I'll just leave it right there. Um. Uh, Oh, Molly, I didn't realize that. Um, I thought Danny Gregory founded Sketchbook School, so that makes more sense that the founder is, um, I don't even know how to say that, but y'all can see it in the, in the um, chat. So Kathleen wants to know about, um, and a couple of you wanted to know about, I'm going to push this up here a second. And this is the little piece I did on the saffron loom. There we go. And um, Kathleen was asking about blocking. So <laughs> Kate, who says 60 years is old. Um, I'm just saying that loom has been used hard. <laughs> I think you could get a 60 year old loom that had hardly been used that was uh, in better shape than mine is. Um, so Kathleen was asking about um, blocking. This is the back. I've already started to um, do some of the tails on the back of this piece, but she wants to know um, uh, some things about finishing and um, so what I do first of course this is all in the warp and weft class um, on a big piece I vacuum first because there will be uh, dust wool dust all over the piece when you've been work weaving on a piece for um, months and months there's a lot of wool dust on it and then I do all the finishing on the back, which is tidy up all the slits and um, needle in the ends, especially on a large piece. I always needle in all of the ends. And then I don't always do it on the small ones because I'm, if I'm going to mount them, but it's just this kind of thing to hold them in. And then, um, then I will uh, steam it, which allows the piece to shrink. And then I will do the um, edges. So on this piece, I was going to do a little braid. And then um, blocking. Um, so Kathleen says, um, wants to know if I block pieces. And so the word blocking is, um, People mean different things by the word blocking. In knitting, blocking means you get your, well, I'm going to say this and y'all are going to have 400 different ideas about what blocking is. In my mind, if you block something in knitting, you get it wet and you lay it out on a board or a <clears throat> bed or a table or something and you pin it out the way you want it to look and you let it dry. 
and um, that makes the piece nice and beautiful when you take it off. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, I don't block my tapestries in that way, but I do use a steamer and the steamer gets the piece quite wet and shrinks it um, so that everything sort of comes together and becomes like a more cohesive thing. Um, I don't, so often students will ask me about blocking because the edges of their tapestry will bow out and they're like, can I block it so it's square? And to some extent you can, if, if um, it's minor, you could pin a small piece, you could pin it, a large piece. I've seen people take boards and actually put nails through the piece to stretch it out. Make sure you use nails that are stainless so they don't rust um, when you get it wet and then they get the tapestry wet and let it dry. The thing with doing that is that um, over time with humidity or if the tapestry ever gets wet again, it will go back to its original shape. Um, but um, So in that sense, no, I don't block it. But in the sense of, yes, I steam it and I get it very fairly wet and I lay it flat and let it dry. Um, if that's what you mean by blocking, then yes, I block my pieces. Um, I hope that helps. Um, if you're in the fringeless class, Sarah Sweat shows how she actually puts her tapestries in water and she shows it with, um, she shows, she shows it with small pieces. Um, they get a bath and then they get laid out and then um, she squeezes the water out and then she puts books on them for a little while to press them flat and then she lets them dry. She actually does that with her large tapestries also. They go in the bathtub. So um, it is possible to actually wash a tapestry. Uh, yeah, Michelle is asking about how I back the small tapestries. I don't actually put backing on any of my tapestries. Um, I have a fear of, of bugs and I feel like, um, and there are people who don't believe that this is a problem, um, which is fine. But um, I feel like if I have a fabric back on the tapestry, there's I'm more likely to have an infestation problem, although in Colorado, who knows? It's just that if I sold a tapestry to someone who lives somewhere really wet and the moths got between, moths love dark places. So if they get between the backing and the tapestry, they could chew a hole in the tapestry before you knew it. So I don't actually put fabric backing on any of my tapestries um, at this point anyway. But um, in the, which class is it? I get all of them mixed up in my head because I just wrote this book. There's a long um, piece in my new book about how to mount small tapestries. The American Tapestry Alliance has several good articles about mounting tapestries. So just go to their education section. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but um, mounting them on stretcher frames or stretching fabric around a piece of archival foam core and then stitching the tapestry to it is a great way to mount tapestries. Um, I talk about how I hang my large tapestries in Warp and Weft. I think there's a video about mounting small tapestries in the Little Looms class. Um, glad you're having fun in the Little Looms class, Kathy, and your sister. That's cool. Oh, that's nice. So Jessica's saying when she um, when she's stitching the ends in, she'll stitch the ends in and then tie a knot. So like I think this is what you mean, Jessica. If I do this, so she would do this and do all the rest of them and tie. I think this is what you mean. She'd tie a knot in this so that she knew that she'd already put that one under, which is a good question that you. Um, if you left them and didn't cut them, that you would forget which ones had already been stitched in, and sometimes it's hard to tell. But I actually just cut them off right away so that I know. But that is a great tip, Jessica. Um, oh, that's a great, Anna. That's really nice. So um, I don't know Pat Taylor, but using brass nails, so that would be good so it doesn't rust. Um, putting the tapestry at the smallest dimension. So I think what you mean is say the edges of this were bowing out a little, you'd sort of bring them in and nail them down. 
and then get it wet so it shrinks. Some materials will shrink more than others, but if it's minor, um, you will be able to get it to shrink to the right size. So that's cool. So shrinking it to the dimension instead of trying to stretch it. That's a great point, Anne. Anna. Uh, oh, Elsie's asking about framing since we're talking about finishing. Um, I don't like glass. This is just another personal opinion. I don't like glass on tapestry. Um, I think that it promotes mold. I think if there's moisture in there, it can um, cause problems that way. And I just feel like, you know, tapestry is about texture and fabric and it's a piece of cloth. And if there's glass in front of it, you lose that um, interaction with the fact that it's a piece of cloth. So, so my personal opinion is I don't, I hate seeing tapestries behind glass. Sure, you can do it. Um, but it's not, it's just not my favorite thing. Oh, good, good point, Sarah. So um, Sarah is qualifying my, I was saying that she washes her tapestry and tapestries and she says, make sure that you know the source of the yarn, basically. Did you dye it yourself? Do you know that it's water fast? So if you wove a piece like this, and I didn't know that this red um, color was color fast, this is yarn that I dyed myself. And I, um, I, you know, I'm washing it when it's done. I'm making sure that the color is staying. So I'm certain that this red will not bleed. But if I had bought this yarn from somebody else, or I wasn't a good dyer, or I screwed it up and I, you know, wasn't paying attention and didn't put acid in the dye bath or something, um, this red could run all over and ruin the tapestry. So you have to make sure that, and that's even true of steaming. If I steam it really heavily and the yarn is not color fast, um, it can be a pretty dis much of a disaster. So if you don't know and you're buying a new yarn and you're going to dunk it in water, make sure you test that yarn before you dunk the whole tapestry into a bath. Um, Sarah says that the tapestries feel delicious after being washed. And Sarah uses a lot of um, wool warps, wool, wool on wool. And so she has this beautiful, soft texture to her tapestries. And I think the washing helps just make it all this wonderful, cohesive thing. Um, Huh, that's an interesting question, Paula. I've never had that question before. Um, if you don't back tapestries that will be mounted on the wall, are you concerned about dark or bright colors marking a light-colored wall? No, because of what I just said about my yarns. I dye them myself and I, myself and I know that the color is fast. Um, I would never use a yarn in a tapestry that was going to crock or um, rub the color off onto a wall. So um, if I didn't know... Yeah, I would never use a yarn like that in a tapestry because it would all bleed and, um, yeah. So, no, I'm not worried about that. Good question, though. Um. <laughs> Jessica, yeah, that's what I figured you were saying about putting the knot. Jessica's talking about the knot when she stitches it in so she knows. I would do the same thing if I didn't cut them off right away. I would just keep stitching them in again because I didn't know that I'd already secured them. So that's funny. Uh, oh, yeah, Michelle, that's a great. And for small tapestries, I'm mostly talking about backing large scale tapestries. Back to the thing about the fact that I don't like to have a fabric backing on my tapestries. There are lots and lots and lots of tapestry weavers who love to put backings on their tapestries. They, it covers up the, um, they leave their tails and it covers up the tails. And um, I don't leave my tails for one thing, so that's one another reason I don't do it. But um, she's talking about smaller things and like making them into jewelry or, um, I actually have a friend who makes little tiny tapestries this size and smaller who likes to put a back, a fabric back with a piece of um, archival cardboard in there so that it just sort of stands up. She'll finish, either do four salvage or 
finish the edges with a hem. And then she'll put them on those little, have you seen those little easels that they sell like at the craft store? Um, so that's a fun reason to do a back on a small tapestry too. And those are stitched all the way around, so bugs aren't gonna get inside. And that might just be my own paranoia, the bug thing, but I feel like it might be true. Linda, what do people do with small tapestries? Was thinking of putting them in a journal to have a progress journal. That's a great idea. I think it would be really fun to have them in a book. Um, there are lots of people who make tapestry books. If you haven't seen, since we were just talking about Sarah, if you haven't seen Sarah Sweat's blog, go and look at the one she put up this week, um, a field guide to needlework.com, um, or just Google Sarah Sweat, or I'll put the link in the thing. Um, Anyway, she just did a little a little book. Was it this week or last week? Anyway, in the last week or two, um, tapestry book. But she's also done covers for tapestry books. And um, mine are all, I'm actually looking at mine. They're all pinned to the wall. And um, I did a, the series that I did for the Petrified Forest. I mounted them on big boards, so a whole series of little tapestries. Another person to look at is Susan Martin Maffei. If you go to her website under traveling I think might be the um, series that she did but she did she used to ride the train across the country all the time and she did little little tiny tapestries as she rode the train of what she was seeing out the window and then she mounted them all on these huge long um, mounts and so it's this really fun thing of seeing you can imagine like traveling across the country and seeing all of those little tapestries so anything like that. Um, mine are pinned to a board right here with the intention at some point of um, mounting them, something like that, and putting them in a show. I think small things do need to be mounted, um, but uh, putting them in a book or something like that, that would be great. Oh, see, Judy, I'm not crazy. Judy says um, she was a framer for a gallery. Textiles under glass can mold due to moisture formed from temperature change. Thank you. I didn't have a real basis for that feeling that there could be mold and moisture behind the glass, but I've seen textiles behind glass in people's houses that have mold growing up the side. So um, thanks for reinforcing my little bit of paranoia about that, Judy. Um, yeah, Donald, I agree. There's nothing worse than having colors bleed after you've finished a complicated piece. I have um, purchased yarns that were dyed by someone else who did not. Um, I think that they either didn't cook the yarn long enough or they didn't put enough acid in and have, I, did, I hadn't actually woven with the yarn, but I, um, I was over dyeing one of the colors and I put it in the water and it just bled. And I was like, holy cow, I'm so glad I didn't weave with this yarn because it was a disaster. Um, I didn't use any of it. I actually um, got rid of it. That's not true. I over dyed some of it with the correct amount of acid and it made a beautiful brown. But the rest of it I got rid of. Um... Uh, I, Dorothy, I think Michelle was talking about the backing. She was having trouble finding the English word, but maybe um, Michelle can come up with the, the backing on a small tapestry. Um, I think the word, the way I understood the word, word manta is like the Navajo or Native American mantas are w like worn weavings, but um, I'm sure it has other meanings. So that's a great question, Susan. We were talking about finishing, and um, I use a steamer. She asked whether I use an iron or a steamer, and um, I use a Jiffy steamer, um, the kind that has the wand, so the kind that has a reservoir at the bottom and then a big wand. So you have to be able to lay the tapestry flat on a table, and a lot of clothes steamers are those little ones that have to be held upright that are meant to steam clothes when they're hanging. Those don't work. Um, but the ones that have a wand, I really like it because it gets super hot and um, I can get the tapestry 
the temperature up fairly high, but a lot of people use an iron, just a steam iron. You can get the, you can spray the tapestry a little bit or use a, um, like a thin cotton towel that's wet and lay it over the tapestry and then use the steam iron and sort of hover above the tapestry. And if you have a good iron and it's quite hot, it will work pretty much just as well as the steamer does. Yes, Marlena, I agree that Molly Elkine's small tapestries are beautifully framed. Um, Tommy Scanlon also has beautifully framed tapestries. Um, she, I haven't seen as many pictures of her small ones. I got to see some in person when she was teaching at Penland. But um, same thing, they both have beautiful mountings. So you can look at their websites and... Um, look at some framing ideas. Oh, sorry. So Dorothy, Susan, I was talking about Susan Martin Maffei. So she has a double last name. Um, Martin is just like it sounds. And then her last, last, last name, if you just Googled this, M-A-F-F-E-I. And I will put the link to that in that on my, um, in, on this page. Um, she has a great website and definitely go there and look at such innovative work. The stuff she's doing right now is just stunning. Um, she's just has an amazing mind and she uses tapestry in so many different ways. So I can't recommend highly enough going to look at Susan Martin Maffei's um, website, M-A-F-F-E-I. And uh, she um, was Archie Brennan's partner and Archie died in October, but she and Archie had this great collaboration, and it's um, fascinating to see her stuff. Yes, Carol has it there, except it actually has two Fs. Um, and her website's just susanmartinmeffe.com. Awesome. Victoria also has a Jiffy steamer. I bought a Jiffy steamer because that is what James Kohler had. And um, I used his a lot and it worked great. So I bought one. Um, that's interesting, Kate. Yeah, I think there's ways you could actually like a recessed frame, a thicker frame, if you really had a piece that you wanted to be not have dust and stuff on it, there's probably ways to make sure that there's air getting in so it can dry without um, having that problem with moisture. I'm sure that there, framers are so smart. Um, I'm sure there's ways to make that happen. And Okay, cool, Donald. Donald says he uses a steam iron and sheets over his tapestries and his works are large. Um, Cool. So it sounds like y'all are doing well for this Friday. Um, I hope that you have a great weekend. And um, I hope I sort of answered your question, Kathleen, about the um, blocking and the finishing. And if you have more questions, ask in the online class. And um, I will see you on Monday. And I hope that uh, y'all have a good weekend. Oh, that is a good question. I think this is Audrey. Um, sorry, one more. <laughs> um, I really think it's important to do the steaming on a flat, hard surface, um, but maybe not. She's asking if she can do it on her bed. Like I would block knitting on my bed. I block it on the carpet, on the floor all the time. Um, but I use for the tapestries, I use a... Um, I have a great big table with a laminate top that can take the steam. Also do not use a steamer on like this table that this is on under this yoga thing is plastic. Do not steam something on a plastic table because the steam is really hot and the table will warp. So um, on a small thing, it probably doesn't matter. Um, my really small tapestries, I actually have like a, a building tile that I like a 12 inch building tile that I lay them flat on and then steam it. So, or like a, if you have like a granite countertop or something that can take the heat, 
I think that's probably better than a bed just because it's firm, but it's just my opinion. Um, okay, I got sidetracked there. Have a good weekend, you guys. And um, it is Friday today, just orienting myself. And I will see you all on um, Monday morning. So do some weaving and I'll uh, maybe I'll show you what I did on Monday.